thing. Uh, I hope that everybody got the um, link that we sent this morning uh, to all of you. It had equity issues and whatnot in it. We've expanded a, a little bit. I'm gonna give you a minute just to kind of look through it. Um, we just created it as a resource for people, but you might want to just spend a few minutes just looking um, um, it over. It may jog something that you want to talk about, um, et cetera. David, if you're having trouble, I can text it to you. Do you have your phone next to you? Yeah, well, I'm looking at my phone. Um, so you sent a, I just sent a, 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 a link about issues. I just sent a Google uh, doc. We sent a Google doc link earlier today that had oh, equity. Was that I'm not sure I saw that. It, uh, is that different than the um, religious and equity issues or is that exactly what you're talking about? It's the same document. I just posted it into the chat. If you click on it, you'll see it. Okay, just a sec. It has the same title and everything. Oh. We just added um, police issues, bills, and we added um, we just we, we added a, a few other uh, I don't, you know what I have here when I open that link? Just, it, okay, wait a minute, here. Okay, all right. Oh, I see. Uh, all right, pre-filed bills. Caleb, are you having trouble with it? No, not at all. Uh, I'm just looking over. I unfortunately didn't get this link last night, so I'm just looking over uh, the rest of the uh, equity document you provided. Right. So we sent that last night, or we sent it mm, maybe last night or this earlier today, and I've just added to it. I'm just creating a resource document for people. So. Um, I'm not asking that you know everything that's on there. Just creating a resource document um, to cover, um, you know, various issues. So I just want to give you a minute to look at it. Oops. Um, think about it. Process it for a minute. Um, Chad, can you? Did you already post that on our Facebook page? That document? No, the document. Did you want to post that? The one that's in the chat, so people can follow along. Or do you want to wait till afterwards? Uh, we can we can post it in there. Um, like, like right now, we're streaming to YouTube and sharing it from there to our page and group. So we'll we'll put the link in the comments. Okay. But I think we're all set up and good to go. You ready to go? So I thought we would start by um, each of you just introducing yourselves a little bit. Tell us a little bit about why you're interested in the 45th. And at Race Matters, of course, everything is centered in the issues of equity and inclusion. So you might talk a little bit about how you define equity versus equality and what those things mean to you and how they will be embedded in your practice as a legislator. If elected. Who wants to go first? Chad. <laughs> All right, I pick Caleb. <laughs> I guess we're going to go with beauty before age then. Oh. <laughs> uh, first, I want to uh, thank Race Matters Friends for creating this forum and inviting interested members of the public and interested candidates to come speak about the issue of representing House District 45 and why it's all important to all of us. I also, at the outset, have to give the obligatory disclaimer that any statements I'm making here today are representative of myself and my own views and aren't representative of my views as my views as an attorney for the Missouri Office of Public Counsel. I just want to be very clear on that because state employees are usually under a big mag magnifying glass when it comes to where, when they speak in public. For the past three years, I have been representing the public before the Public Service Commission, the regulatory entity that sets utility rates for, uh, for investor-owned utilities across the state. 
So I'm not helping Colombians when dealing with water and light, but I am helping Colombians when it comes to Amber and Missouri gas. The reason why I bring this up is because I think it ties directly to one of the issues of equity, which is that a lot of the times I'm fighting on issues that are three to six dollar bill uh, three to six dollars on bill increments. For a lot of people, that doesn't mean a lot. If you're working poor, it's enough to throw off your entire budget and put you in potentially catastrophic situations of eviction or an unstable living environment. So, uh, unfortunately, we know that those issues are most severe in that that people of color disproportionately experience those types of how of housing instability and inability to access utility services. And so that's been one of the driving forces for my current work. Before then, I actually worked for the legislature as an analyst for both caucuses. I, uh, I staffed multiple different committees from economic development, commerce, and small business. And I did that from 2016 to 2018. That, that position gave me lessons on the politics and the strategies of economic development and when it has failed and when it hasn't. Unfortunately, when it's failed, it has often been to the detriment of small of minority communities that have often been ignored or exploited for larger developments. That is some of the knowledge base that I'm taking forward and is giving my consideration for why I want to represent the 45th. I want to avoid those mistakes in the future. Thank you. For that. <laughs> Thank you for that, Caleb. Um, Scott, do you want to go next? And I also want to thank Race Matters Friends. I do not have to worry about any um, statements about just this being my personal opinions, since obviously they are. I work for myself, come from an entrepreneurial background. I'm basically just a peddler, selling pretty much anything that for the home, ranging from computers to furniture, all kinds of things like that, and set up payment plans, which means I, since I go back and pick up the payments, I get to know my people that I'm dealing with very well, and I get to deal with their personal issues, since for some reason, they feel that partly because of my involvement in the community, that I'm well versed on what agencies that they need to be guided to. When I moved up to Columbia, not knowing anyone at all, I immediately started getting involved and got elected to the board of KOPN. Uh, which I thought was kind of impressive since I hadn't quite moved to Columbia just yet. I also was involved in the Community Services Advisory Board. That's the group that Steve Hollis now runs under a different name. What was important about that is that we gave city and county funds to different nonprofits. And I could take it a step further and because of being familiar with these different agencies now, at least on a small level, I could refer different people that I would talk to who needed help, where they should go and who they could talk to. I continued my involvement through uh, Cultural Affairs Commission to learn more about just different activities I could share with the community. And one of the big things that I've always been involved with at all different levels was giving people the opportunity to get involved or finding ways that they could. I feel that's really important and this is why I decided to extend out and be on, as a representative on the 45th, because I feel I can do, do even more with helping out a lot of the different people that I've been talking to through the years. I get calls all the time that are random, not necessarily about business, for people who are needing help or where to go for assistance, whether it is on rental questions, whether it's just general economic, where to get help. And I'm at the point where I do, I'm able to point them in the direction where they can get help. In terms of democratic politics, as sadly the Republicans have seemed to lost their minds these days, or even, and it's a, been a gradual process, I became more involved with the Democratic Party and helping people to get involved with that, going into neighborhoods that my customer base is in, as well as just other areas. I basically deal with people at all types of different economic levels, and I try to bring different people together from different groups that may not necessarily have any reason or connection with others. In terms of equity and equality, my basic feeling is that everyone should have an opportunity 
and be encouraged to pursue it and find the ways that they can. And I'm happy to help out with that type of level of things. Thank you, Scott. Um, David, that leaves you. And David, I muted you for a minute. <laughs> Ready to go here? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Awesome. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank Race Matters Friends for the invitation. Uh, I'm excited to be here and I'm, I've been looking forward to this uh, since last week. So thank you for doing this and really uh, getting the ball rolling with this, these candidate issues because I think they're extremely important. Um, and I want to say thank you to Caleb and Scott for joining and, and their participation in the process. Um, although Caleb did kind of dig at me about age, but I, I'm, still, I'm still pretty too. <laughs> um, you know, so fundamentally, you know, there's several reasons why I wanted to run uh, this seat. Um, one is, you know, my background in criminal justice. So I have practiced criminal defense for almost 20 years. Um, I have seen things that are shocking. Uh, I have seen the system from the inside. Um, you know, I practiced for, you know, I practiced at a criminal clinic in New Orleans briefly before moving back to Columbia, where I started Smith and Park over 15 years ago. And you would, you would be surprised at the things that are going on, not only in this country, but in the state. I've seen people who um, were really mentally disabled. Uh, I remember when I was a law student, one of the things that got me excited about criminal justice was I was working with a supervising attorney while in law school, I was involved in this, uh, this litigation clinic, a criminal clinic. And there was a woman that was, she basically, um, I think she had some mental disabilities. And down there, they had a draconian three strikes route, meaning if you commit three felonies, you're looking at 20 years in prison. And if they're quote unquote violent. And this woman took a purse from a lady on a bus. She, she got off the bus and realized that it was the wrong thing to do. She threw the purse back across the street and all the contents fell out. The woman who she took the purse from was holding a baby. So this woman who was a person of color who took the purse goes to give everything back. She's just confused. And she goes to hand, she says, here, let me give you everything back. She hands her the wallet and then you know, has a crisis and then decides to take the wallet. She was looking at about 20 years in prison for that. Uh, and the Louisiana penitentiary system was awful. And I was with my supervising attorney and the judge didn't want to censor her. I could tell he didn't want to do it. He knew it was wrong, but that's what the law said was the correct thing to do. And he looked at my supervising attorney and said, Betty, is there anything else? And no, I can't think of anything. And he went to raise the gavel. It was almost off of like, it was dramatic as a television show. And said, wait. And he sat and it got really quiet in the courtroom. And she said, he didn't, she didn't steal the woman's purse. She took her wallet. And by statute, it was a purse snatching. And everyone looked at the law and he said, you're right. And the prosecutors object, this is outrageous. But the law was the law and she saved her life. And just by catching something like that, a little caveat in the law kept this woman from doing two decades in, in the state penitentiary. So, and she shouldn't have done that. I mean, not for stealing a wallet. And so I've seen these issues from the inside um, and I've seen them in Missouri. I've seen um, people being charged with crimes they shouldn't be charged with. My job is every day I get up and I deal with uh, police and prosecutors charge people with crimes that they probably shouldn't be charged with. And if they are even guilty of a crime, they, they, they add layers on top of it. So where it should be a misdemeanor, now it's a felony. Or it should be one felony, now it's three. And I've seen it even more in outstate Missouri, rural areas, where, I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing where people get charges loaded on top of them. And oftentimes the state isn't even familiar with what's going on. They just file these charges and turn their back on the case. So I've seen firsthand what happens with poor legislation, um, when legislation legislation is drafted in a proper way, how people suffer, especially people at the bottom of the ladder. I mean, you're talking about people who might be poor and franchised. They're not getting, they're not going to get justice. Not, I think we have good public defenders. The problem is they're overworked. That's another issue. And they're overworked. I may go see a client and have one client a day in the jail, or maybe two. A lot of these public defenders will show them they'll be seeing 15, you know, and how do you get presentation 
proper representation when they're seeing so many people. So I've seen from the first hand the issues involving criminal justice and the lack of equity, poverty, race, what happens to people when they're at the bottom of the spectrum and there isn't equity and there really isn't. And we're, we're away from that. We make incremental gains, but have we achieved what we need to achieve? Secondly, my work with the Citizens Police Review Board. When we launched that, we started that in 2006. I went to the city council with a group of citizens and submitted a proposed ordinance. Um, we had a chief of police that had power for about 20 years, um, an old guard chief of police. And people thought we were crazy. They <laughs> thought it wasn't nothing, we weren't gonna ever get it passed. There weren't any changes. Um, the, I believe there's a police officers union at that time put my name, I believe when you logged onto the website, if I'm correct, my name was at the top and my address. So I don't know if that was designed to intimidate. I don't want to make that, I don't want to make any presumptions, but I thought it was odd that they had my name there with my address. So there was an issue of We still have Kayla, we still have Scott. Is David stuck? Okay, he froze. David. Do we have another way to reach out to David? Uh, I'm gonna text him. Yeah, he had mentioned he has like a, an alternate laptop or phone to use that he might drop. Okay. So um, we kind of, we kind, we lost him for a minute. Let's give him a second. Um, so you, you both have sort of the kind of a, the rundown of equity issues. Um, they're religious, they're um, gender related, they're um, police uh, related. Um, there, you can see there's bad, some bad uh, bills in play. Um, there's some good stuff in play. And David was just talking about what he's seen in the criminal justice system. And as you know, uh, Race Matters Friends has been very focused on, for some time, on trying to get um, the Columbia Police Department to embrace the philosophy of the community oriented policing. So I would say that we had been in the mode of trying to change hearts and minds for a long time, but I, I think that we now realize that that's not working. And so we need um, interventions, different kind of interventions in policy and practice. And that looks very um, differently. So I'm just curious um, for both of you, um, given that, and I'll, I'll kind of go backwards a little bit from the bottom of that uh, list, uh, Post said the other day that they were going to have officers take uh, two hours out of their 600 hours of training for to learn about uh, Black history. So I'm wondering what you what you think about that. But let's give David a, a minute to to pop back to pop back in. Now you're upside down, David. <laughs> Guys. You should fit right in. There you go. I mean, usually it's usually David. Usually it's me that's having all these problems with Zoom, and then yeah, Chad. Yeah. Chad makes fun of me, so it's. I mean, right, like right now, I'm like doing good. Like I'm really happy because yeah, you're like looking at me like, what are you doing now? But anyway, you got interrupted a little bit about right. talking about the criminal justice system, and so while you were gone, I said, let's just kind of look back at the list again, and I'm kind of going from the bottom, and I think this. Okay kind of ties into what you were talking about, the criminal justice sure. system. Sure. And I also said that we, at Race Matters Friends, one of our big issues has been trying to reform the police department through getting, by getting them to embrace a philosophy of community oriented policing. And so we discovered trying to change hearts and minds doesn't work, um, that we need um, systemic uh, or interventions. We have, to, we have to intervene in policy in other ways. So um, at the bottom of the list, we talk about some reforms for um, policing. And just a couple of days ago, they're offering two hours of, 
of, of training uh, if you, for, for the police out of 600 via post on, on black history. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get your feedback on that because the issues with the police, as we see with vehicle stops, or even the things that um, David was talking about, we see in many of those kinds of issues through our bail fund. And so what are your, what are your thinking as a legislator, as a legis potential legislators, how, what are your thoughts about getting our police to uh, reimagine and transform themselves? I personally don't think that, but so, I mean, somebody can talk me down and uh, help me, you know, help me on that. And David, we'll go to you because you got cut off and I'll give you a, a couple minutes for each of you to respond to that. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with this uh, tech, technology. Tech, technology. Um, so community policing has always been very uh, a, a complicated concept. And I think primarily you're dealing with uh, how it's interpreted. Um, it, it has been problematic when you have police in schools, okay? And charging people with felonies. I mean, I've had cases where you have teenagers that are being charged with, you know, it's under the, the rubric of community policing um, that are being charged with felonies for simple fights and things that normally you just get sent to the principal's office for. Then you've got young people who are now in the criminal justice system because of uh, the guise of community policing. So the question is, how do you deal with these issues? You know, one aspect, um, Tracy, they talk about, well, you need, you know, you've heard, well, they don't have enough resources to have police, for example, walk around the city. So they need more officers. And so that's an argument where you need to have, you know, two officers walking around, so they have to staff up. So, because a lot of times officers are reactive, right? So they get a call, they're reacting. So there's a negative feeling within the community regarding the police, because the police are just reacting to problems and people don't see them as, uh, as friends or neighbors or people that are just there to help. But then do you really want to do that, right? So, and Tracy, you mentioned, can you trust their hearts to do the right thing? So if, if you provide money, uh, for extra officers so they can spare the officers to walk around, to talk to neighbors. Are they going to use it for that purpose? Or uh, are they, go ahead. No, I, I, I agree with you. And I always say the philosophies. And, and so I think what you're saying is that maybe we have a clash on philosophies. So for me, for us, it has not been about the number of officers and all that. It's about changing their culture, right? So community policing is about having a guardian mindset, seeing yourself as a part of the community. And I do think that that us versus them thing is very strong. And so we're not even down in the weeds on uh, how many officers and all that, because we still can't get to this. We embrace you as one of us and you embrace, we're not there. We're, no, that's, that's not going on. Um, and, and also even with the CPRB that you helped establish, it's, it's been modified in a way that they are also disconnected from the community. And so, you know, short of taking a hammer and starting to, you know, break things um, out of frustration, um, it's really frustrating. So we're not interested in having a conversation with them about how many officers they need, because in our opinion, and I think this goes for a lot of police departments, um, their culture needs to change. And, and that includes you know, their culture of what they think about being, getting training or getting education. So that's why I asked about that question about post. Is two hours of training or education, I don't wanna use the word training, gonna make a dent in the culture so that they, they, they change their mindset of how they engage people in the community? I don't, if I can respond quickly, I, I don't think so. But, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because when we were establishing the review board, we talked about training and their officers' response is, you know, we have so much training already. We can't afford to do any more training. We were already doing, you know, I don't know what the 50, 100 hours. So I don't, it's very difficult to get them to increase the training. So no, two hours isn't going to do it. It's better than nothing. Right. But is there a way to get them to keep doing more training? I, I Realistically, I think it'd be very difficult. Yeah, I, I think, I'll, not only do I think it's difficult, but I, I think more to the point, and I'll ask Scott and Caleb, 
you know, I, I would question their, um, I, I, I would question their whole uh, training as a package. Um, the research says that they have a culture of not liking training, um, that their training doesn't fit what they do on the street. And so there's this huge disconnect altogether. So to me, adding the two hours just adds more confusion to an already messed up you know, framework. So, um, but we seem to continually get into these um, uh, situations where we're kind of putting band-aids on, on larger things. And I'm not even sure that's a band-aid. I just added paper about um, adding uh, the history uh, two hours. Um, but we'll cycle back to that. Um, Scott or Caleb, do you want to jump in uh, to that? Sure. I'd be happy to. First off, I remember when David was part of that group that performed the Citizens uh, Review Board. And I think that was really a wonderful thing because the hurdles that they all had to come through were immense. Sadly, I don't think it's living up to the expectations. As you pointed out, Tracy, there have been modifications to that. The good thing is at least that's there. But getting back to the training, two hours, as David said, are better than nothing. But I would, nothing is pretty bad, Tracy. So, and I'm not saying that by any means is enough. But what I've noticed, there's a lot of lack of knowledge just in the population in general, and I'm putting the police in that, about the history of different, different ways people were treated and especially in the terms of way black people have been treated. And, and since there are only so many hours in this training, and I'm not familiar, I'll be honest, with all the things that the police officers do, I'm sure I can guess as well as anyone else in terms of their training, but maybe they could be some more practical type of experience. They could talk with people who have been through the prisons and have changed their lives around. They could talk with people and spend time with people who are from the different neighborhoods and tell the police officers, these are the things that we need to do. Right now, I suspect the training is mostly a, a standardized type of thing that is done all the same through most of the country. And that's not working. No, it's not. The police have got more of a militarization type of approach. And we've seen that with the protests down in Ferguson when they brought in different tanks and ride gear and that type of thing. And that is not the way to diffuse a bad situation or even act to prevent a situation from getting worse. Now, in terms of some of the things that you're talking about, Tracy, some of those things would be local and I would think would be best to pro going through the city council with the state legislature maybe being a backup. In our current environment, I don't think we're gonna be able to get a whole lot done through Jeff City, just being realistic. There, has to, there would be ways to go around and maybe get, uh, whether it's referendums or whether it's changing things at the city council. As we all know, people more than ever are in their personal bubble. They don't know what's going on outside of these particular things. When I say particular things, I'm talking about what's happening in a, a community that they have no contact with. So the education process has to be to the community as well as to the police so people know what is going on. Because basically, and I'm talking from white people that I have talked with, they are shocked at the different things from uh, Mr. Lloyd and what happened up in Minnesota. They were shocked at all the different videos that have been coming out showing some of the police actions that we would never expect to see in this, in this country. Tracy, you're muted. Tracy, you're still muted. Uh oh, thank you, Scott. Kayla, would you like to respond to um, David and um, Scott's remarks? Yes, thank you. Um, tr uh, Tracy, you first mentioned the two hours of uh, African American history training that's been added to Columbia's police service. Um, obviously, I think that in a vacuum is an objectively good idea. I want the officers in my community to understand that, you know, less than a hundred years ago, we had a famous lynching of James Scott right off Stewart Bridge. I want the 
police, uh, I want those people policing our communities to understand that the reason why Providence was cut through to the highway instead of cutting through Rollins is because it was cheaper to cut through the majority black neighborhood on Cemetery Hill versus going through Rollins and the university. I want them to understand those issues. Um, obviously there is, there's a problem though where it's, so we're not going to combat this warrior mentality by simply increasing the ratio of equity training relative to total all training. Right. When we're talking about these equity issues, there's an intersection of everything from feminism, environmental justice, racial issues. And so that training needs to be incorporated through, I would say nearly all the hours of police training that we have now. Um, all joking aside, I actually wanna take this moment to uh, thank David for his work with the Police and County Board, because I believe the work that we've seen with the Police and County Board combined with the work that we've seen from the RMF bail fund and people's defense, it helps create, I, I don't know if I came up with this term, but I wanna pretend I did. It's the ecosystem of accountability. What we're seeing now is that when actors are, there's not gonna be one silver bullet to solve this, to solve the larger quote unquote problem of over-policing and racial discrimination. However, when, when we have multiple actors all engaging together in good faith, we can start get towards more just results. So you might be asking, what's the house district representative gonna help in that role? As a, as a House District Representative, neither of us can like pass a law to stop Columbia police from doing bad things. However, first and foremost, and what I see in my campaign is encouraging accountability. And one of the biggest deterrents we have to accountability right now is the qualified immunity status that police officers have. If a police officer commits a civil tort or civil harm against someone and goes way above and beyond what was reasonable action, in, in a perfect system, that, that person could then become a client of, say, David's law firm, and David would then have a financial incentive to encourage that accountability to the police reform, and then that police department has, not, has money, it has skin in the game on actually improving its actions. If, it, if there's qualified immunity that effectively bars a suit, or rather, what we've, what we've seen recently is if we keep tinkering with the procedural rules of how you initiate a suit and how you capture someone into a lawsuit, if you mess with the joinder rules and venue, you've effectively insulated police departments without actually repealing the Missouri Human Rights Act. I think all of us all understand that our role as a representative House District 45 would be to combat, to be combat those legal challenges and to continue to hold community stakeholders accountable and to encourage that ecosystem of accountability I mentioned earlier. Um, I like your word of ecosystem accountability. I think it's something that we talk about a lot in Race Matters Friends, um, particularly when it comes to the Citizens Police Review Board. You know, how, what is their role in accountability? And then, of course, what is the role as a state? And as you said, as a single legislator, um, you're limited. So um, I guess what I'm thinking is, is what does that look like? Because Scott mentioned that, you know, there's this thing called the, the other side, the Republicans. You know, what does it look like um, to be a legislator um, advocating for that kind of accountability? Because you are going to get push, pushback. So are, are any of you thinking strategically how you might do things differently in terms of working um, with communities um, in your um, district in the 45th? Um, because there is that educational part that Scott's talking about. There is this stuff that David's talking about that's crazy that we don't see. Our Bell Fund sees it a lot because they're there, they're keeping track of what's going on and all that. And of course, um, Caleb, you see it from your um, particular um, realm of the world. So how do, we, how do we make these things more visible and get um, accountability knowing that we have um, this, you know, resistance, and you can see on the list there of bad policies, uh, they're kind of kind of embarrassing to look at some of the things that are are on there. Quite frankly, I I was shocked some of the stuff that's on there. Um, but I'm I'm moving I'm moving up a little ways from uh, talking about police accountability, but not entirely. Like there's a note on there, like a question about social media. You know, we have cops that get online and say all kinds of crazy stuff, and there's can't do anything to them. Um, we have the Columbia Police Officers Association, can't do anything to that guy. I mean, he's been quiet, but 
the thing that's crazy is that the police officers still want to have a person who dehumanizes people who are not white as their representative. That's wild. That's wild. So, um, you know, moving up from there, we start to look at these other issues like police in the schools, um, the ways that schools have been inter, uh, impacted by police and the ways that parents are impacted um, when they have kids with disabilities, they can't record the meetings, um, you know, the kids are being secluded and restrained. I, I think we have a, a punishment and discipline problem as Angela Davis would say. So um, I'm gonna start back around again. I'm gonna go to David and um, you know, have you com uh, comment again on this? How do you get accountability or work towards some meaningful accountability knowing you've got that kind of resistance on the other side of the aisle? I think that you know there's a you know there's two philosophies oftentimes when when you look at legislators who've worked down in Jeff, especially with a Republican majority, um, super majority, if you will. You know, one view is you know you go down there and you know throw hand grenades and and you know you stand up and say this is what we're going to do, um, and, and not budget on anything. There's another philosophy as well. You can't get anything done. Um, I'm sorry, you know, and I've heard that. Well, you know you know, we don't need flamethrowers and, um, you know, this is never going to happen. And I disagree with that. Um, I think you have to be firm in your resolve. I think you can do two things. And I've always found that if you're honest with people, they may not like it, but they're going to respect it. So as opposed to going down to Jeff City with the notion, well, I can't get anything done. One, you establish relationships, but then you're firm in what you want to do. And you're vocal and you call people out on what's appropriate and what's not. And it's not a time to be mousy and it's not a time to um, um, kind of tuck and run because in a super minority, you can get a lot done by working with people and establishing relationships. A lot of people want to do the right thing. And a lot of people don't know some of the horrors that go on in the criminal justice system. You know, I like what you said, Scott, about people being shocked about the George Floyd thing. You know, in, in, in the black community, the people in the black community weren't shocked. No, not right? at all. Right. I mean, to us, it was, that was a Tuesday. I mean, it was shocking. Don't get me wrong. It was awful. It was ugly. It was difficult to watch. But in many ways, it was a Tuesday. I mean, we, okay, we know that it's horrible. And we could all go back to even personal experiences where we've experienced that. So the question is, how do you get Republicans who maybe are coming from these rural areas and the districts are drawn to accommodate them to see the light? And one is, I think you have to have relationships with them. You can't just stick stay in your group and we're doing it, we're caucusing over here all the time. You have to reach across the aisle, build relationships, talk to people, but be firm about what you want. Um, and, and, you know, and not be afraid to pass legislation because here's the thing, um, you know, Thurgood Marshall talked about litigation and lawsuits. And he said, when you file a lawsuit against somebody, it, it does a couple things. Um, it, it does two things. It educates the other side about what's right and wrong and it educates the public even if you feel like you're gonna lose, right? So if you file a lawsuit against the police or something, you may lose, but people are being educated in the process. So as opposed to going down and saying, you know, hey, I'm not gonna introduce this bill. I'm not gonna to try to get this bill out of committee. It's not gonna work. You, 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 you try anyway. You know, Caleb, you talked about the immunity for officers. Um, there's a couple issues with that. One is it, it's better for that immunity to be stripped, but then you also have the issue of you know, their insurance is going to pay for it anyway. So are right. they really, how, much, how much, how are they really being held accountable? So you take away the immunity when they have insurance plan. And as long as it's not a $50 million suit, you know, uh, you know, uh, is anything, <laughs> right? right is anything, so um, I, I'd say be firm in your belief, put people's feet to the fire and don't be afraid to, to introduce legislation. Don't be afraid to introduce bills. You know, they say, well, you got to get, you know, and you may have to get a co-sponsor but you have to find out those people down there that you can work with, but keep these issues on the forefront. I, I think so many politicians go down there and they just want to advance their careers. So they keep quiet till they get to the next level. Let me, let me just play along until I get here. Let me just play along until I get there. And then they never end up doing anything. Right. Um, and nothing gets done. So don't play along, fight for what's right, fight for equity, fight for equality, do what you can to hold law enforcement accountable at this stage. Right. Thank you, David. I, I want to just interject um, quickly because you, you brought up George Ford Floyd and it's, it's just a Tuesday. Um, I was ex explaining to my friend Lynn today that 
uh, the George Floyd thing affected me. A piece of something, something got wrinkled in me from that. Um, and that was uh, seeing the dehumanization that's been normalized. Um, to put your knee on someone's neck, they're crying for their mama and they're, you know, they can't breathe. And it was eight minutes is a long time. I mean, and it, it's kind of built on me and uh, it's, it's, it's painful. It's, it's painful that p- people don't notice, right? Mm. And, and there's other ways that, uh, you know, black people are dehumanized um, daily. And we're, we're expected to um, tolerate it and be positive about it and be informative about it and, you know, not be angry, not have rage. And I, I definitely do. I definitely do have rage. It's like smoldering rage, but it's also pain. So I, I just wanted to say that just to clarify that that Tuesday um, that he's talking about, that's like an every day where you wake up with a heartache. Um, for which there's no medicine for it. And that's killing black people. It's killing brown people. It's killing LBGTQ people. It's killing poor people. And and somehow we have to, um, I don't wanna say humanize because everyone is not seen as human in politics, but our lives are, are valuable. And that is what Black Lives Matter is about. And if there was ever a time to point out um, make the connection about Black Lives Matter is that this guy could stand with his knee on someone's neck and smile with his hand in his pocket. And that is everyday business um, coming out of policing. So I just wanted to make that clarification about Tuesdays, they hurt. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I wanna say uh, just a quick follow up if I could, uh, Tracy, about that. Um, I wasn't yeah. picking on you. I, no, I'm, no. I, I it's, 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 it's that kind of authentic, authentic vulnerability that you were just expressing that that needs to be a part of our politics which it is not and you know we have no way of knowing how people are going to go to office and the power is not going to go to their head because hey I have power now I'm special and I can just be quiet because you know all these other white people that are here they're being quiet no one's going to make me do anything and if my constituents email me like some of those other people I don't have to respond because I don't have to Hmm. absolutely Absolutely. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to follow up on what you said about the pain and the rage and, and the microaggressions. Um, when the university was boycotting, uh, the football players were boycotting um, playing because of some of the injustices uh, that were going on. I took my kids down there because I wanted them to see that and talk with people. And I talked with a few of the people who were organizing it. And I asked him and I said, what, tell me about this. Why are you doing this? And one thing he said, he said, the microaggressions. And I thought, microaggressions? And I don't know if I had heard that, I thought microaggressions. And then it's, it's like, he was a young man. I mean, he was probably in his 20s talking about microaggressions. And I thought, and it's just like what you, like what you mentioned. And then all of a sudden I started to think about it and I became enlightened. And I thought, yes, you know, when my child goes to school and he's constantly confused with the only other person of color in class constantly. And they, he looks totally different from the other person. It's the microaggression. And, you know, I, I spoke at one of the, you talked about a life-changing moment with the George Floyd situation. I went to a rally this summer and I, an NAACP rally and I spoke briefly and, you know, people say, well, it's Antifa and all these people are doing all this stuff. The thing is, as you know, uh, and I'm sure Scott and Caleb, it was an organic movement. I mean, this wasn't people calling, hey, come out, come out, because of the microaggressions, because of the pain, the simmering pain, the hurt, people just organically show up. And they're all there. And all the speakers pretty much said about the same thing. No one, no one compared notes. No one said, hey, you talk about this. It was all the same. And all the people, you could see it in their faces. It was an organic movement all across the country because of these aggressions, these microaggressions, and you know, the simmering pot that was boiling. So thank you. So um, I want to also, Caleb and Scott and uh, David, I wanted to go, just mention for the Post uh, uh, article, which my response to the reporter is, is the, is the training that the officers are getting um, uh, framed with anti-racism? Tr- Tracy, it's change over time frozen. because racism is always mutating. Am I frozen? Am I still frozen? You're back now. We kind of missed half of that. 
So I'm just going to make a comment about the, the David's building on David's comment and the article about the post is that my response to the reporter is, uh, is their curriculum, police curriculum rooted in anti-racism? I say, I would say that it's not. Um, and the language changes, people get upset because there's a word like microaggression or there's a word like um, anti-racism. You know, racism is always evolving and the language around it, you know, always changes. But those microaggressions are just slights that are intended to be, um, I don't know, sometimes uh, being gracious and they're actually derogatory. I sat in a conversation the other day where someone said to the person, well, I need to know the, how your ideas were vetted and um, where they came from and if they'd been validated because they're, this is a black person saying it. So um, that's, that's, that's pretty offensive, but you could miss it, miss it because you know, the person could think that you're you know, giving them, a, you know, appreciating them or something like that could take it the wrong way. But um, it's that kind of stuff um, that comes out of people's mouth um, because they have this idea that uh, black people are inferior or brown people are fear or whatever. So again, um, anti-racism, I think is a way of thinking and way of being every day. It's not something that you just put on for two hours in a, in a workshop, right? It's, er it's, every, it's every Tuesday work, right, David? Exactly. Um, oh, just thank you for that, Tracy. Oh, yeah. go, it's, go ahead, Caleb. I think I picked on you last time, Scott, so go ahead, Caleb. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I, I really didn't have much to add other than, I mean, thank you for that statement. I mean, for uh, all the reasons that David said, you, if you're trying to seek racial equity at the Capitol, you immediately have to establish relationships. I think what wasn't necessarily hit on right away, though, was that there is a, there's not just a racial divide in our state, there is a perceived divide uh, amongst the majority caucus that there's a rural urban divide. There are some rural reps that come into that Capitol building and they have not met a black, they've not met a single person of color until they met the St. Louis delegation. Good God. Uh, it is, there, you know, for all, for all the insults that come to liberals about living in a bubble, it's quite surprising to see some people that live in rural Missouri and haven't experienced what someone in Columbia or on the business loop has experienced. If we are, if we are looking to pursue equitable ends for the 45th and for the state at large, I think you immediately need to reach out and start looking for those problems that transcend our divide. Opioid abuse is a problem that transcends the divide. And the prescription drug monitoring program is one key piece of legislation that could immediately have a direct and measurable benefit to not just residents of the 45th, not just people of color, but people across the state. That is something that there is a bipartisan coalition that's been building for that legislation. We have Senator Holly Rader from, uh, she's in the boot heel. She and I disagree on a lot of things. However, we've worked together on this and I would like to continue that work as a house rep. You know, we almost got it across this last session. Uh, Caleb Rowden, not to be confused with yours truly, unfortunately. <laughs> I, um, it's issues like that. It's, PD, it's the PDMP, it's opioid abuse, it's Medicaid expansion these issues that transcend all our boundaries, if we can target on those and show the rest of the state that we have their interests in mind as well, they can help us towards our goals. Great, um, Scott, do you wanna comment? I put a note on there, I don't know if, it, if I spelled it right, Holly Rader, I put R-A-D-R-A-D-A-R. -A -A -R. So it's not like, uh, it's not like Radar from MASH, it's R-E-H-D-R, D-E-R. R-E-H? D-E-R, yes. Okay, you can look that up. Um, All righty, I could go. Go ahead, Scott. All right, and naturally I agree with everything that's been said by David and Caleb. One thing I'll expand uh, and on what Caleb just said in terms about bubbles, bubbles aren't just in the liberal or urban area. It covers all people across everywhere these days. People are just reinforced by listening to what they feel agrees with them. It can be a tough hurdle, but like David was pointing out, relationships, telling the truth, education, all of that can help make a difference. Unfortunately, I've also found that there's a lot of people, we'll say on the other side, who will just have a wall, and as soon as they see that you either are a Democrat or that you don't share a more conservative type of value, a wall is going to be put up. The idea, and I think 
both Caleb and David would be good at this as well, is to get around that and to present them with ways to expand their thinking without actually being threatening to them. The other thing too that I think is really important is getting more and more people educated about the way things are. In terms of like what David said about microaggressions, never haven't heard that be expression before. It was new to myself as well. I, Tracy, you've met my wife. My wife is from South America, so she gives a completely different perspective for the way things are in this country that I was accustomed to growing up because she sees things as differently. One of the things that she pointed out years ago to me was that this is really two countries as she saw it, a black country and a white country with not much interaction except at the edges between those, which was an interesting perspective. And sadly, things have progressed that not only is it an, uh, two different countries in that sense, it's also in terms of people's views in terms of, we'll say, conservative versus liberal. There is a centrist and more middle of the road, although it seems to have grown smaller, where people can get together. The other thing is, David, I understand what you said and Tracy expanded on about it just being another Tuesday. Most people, because of the lives they've lived or grew up with, and I'm talking mostly white people in this particular case, this is brand new news to them. They had no, really had no idea. I think key to everything is getting education out on the different things, not just to the police, but to the community. As David pointed out, a lot of this, of the protests were organic. People came out because they were aggravated. I've been to a few of the protests here in Columbia and saw a tremendous amount of young people, white people out there, and they're not doing it because they have another agenda. They were angry and they were upset that this is something that is going on in the United States today. And I think any of us, any of us being Caleb or Dave, will, going down to Jeff City, will be able to address this situation in terms of educating other people about what's going on. But it's also important to educate people who are just the voters as well as the citizens, because not all, unfortunately, not all citizens vote. And I think that's where we can really make some changes. The other thing that I really think is we are on the cusp, hopefully, of uh, making a lot of strong changes to the way things have been going. There's, gonna, there's a lot of pushback. Hopefully some of this pushback is a last gasp so from some of these groups. Sometimes they're hate groups. Sometimes they're groups that just look the other way. But I think by getting the word out and showing people what things are really like, it make a big difference, not only to our community, but for getting things changed down in Jeff City. So I, um, I just wanna to add to your comment, Scott, and I, it's, a, it's a good one, and I struggle with this one, which is how do you communicate to people so that they don't feel intimidated? So I have a lot of issues about talking to people who are super fragile and they can't hear the truth, so um, I really think that's on white people to deal with white fragility. Um, when it comes to me being a black person, I'm exhausted from trying to deal with people who are ignorant, you know, because black people are always trying to explain, explain, explain. And like the guy, Victor Lewis says on the color field, you get cross-examined and what about this and what about that? And I'm tired of it. So to me, racism is a white people problem. And I think white people need to really take up the slack and, and do the work on it. Um, and because it's frustrating for black people always to be seen like foreigners in their own, in their own space. And um, I, you know, I feel sorry for people who uh, live in that urban rural divide and don't realize that um, and they're big churchgoers that there are people that are, you know, all colors, shapes and sizes. So that confuses me. But um, yeah, I, I have, I understand the idea of articulating messages that don't uh, offend or intimidate people. That's a craft. I think that's a craft. And I don't know how you white guys are gonna do it, um, but it's also different for David being a person of color trying to have that conversation. 
So well, you're absolutely right, Tracy. I totally, I totally agree with that. I believe Caleb, you, you probably do too. The, the way I have found to do this best is having conversations with people and bringing them out, seeing what their stories are. And I'm talking about white people right now. And then pointing out different things that you have, ex have seen, experienced different things that you have heard about and get their reaction to that. Going back to a point that I was bringing up earlier, a lot of white people, and not just mainly because again, and I hate to keep using a bubble because it sounds so narrowing, but unfortunately, there are a lot of white people who have no idea what's going on in the black community. They have very little contact. Maybe they work with some, some people uh, who are African-American, but in terms of really going into details and knowing what is going on in different neighborhoods or what obstacles are out there for them to get involved with and that they come up against. This is all new news. That's why I say something like the George Floyd was such a shocking thing. And here's the other thing too that I've noticed. We have seen even prior to George Floyd, videos that people took on their phones of black men go with the police being shot in the back. A woman down in Texas, I think her name was Sandra Bland, and what happened with her. I don't think until George Floyd, a lot of people, white people that is, really paid attention. It didn't make the impact that that did. And then all of a sudden, it was like enlightenment. Like, wow, this is going on. I'm not saying everybody has gotten in that because they haven't. But it's at least we have a start. And Tracy, you're right. Got it's it. going to take white people talking about these type of situations to other white people. Um, I want to pivot to the bills in just a minute, but Caleb, because uh, we're at the one hour mark, and so I'm kind of going through um, our questions in the chat. Um, but Caleb, do you want to respond to either David or Scott's comments? Um, and my little rant that I just did. <laughs> well, I'm... <laughs> We've all made great points. And I think one thing that we can all be thankful for is the problem of plenty we're seeing in the 45th. We aren't like the 50th or mm -hmm. some of the other districts where we have good people coming forward, but it's a struggle to see if we can see a, a victory for the minority caucus. What we're seeing here is a great slate of people that have come forward that are willing to listen and hear the concerns of the 45th. That's I mean, cool. Honestly, Tracy, you hit it on the head with the communication issue, though. I mean, it's not incumbent upon the Black community to convince any white person to care. It's not incumbent upon the trans community to convince the rest of us that they're people and are deserving of respect. It's not incumbent upon women to convince men to treat them equally. I mean, I'm a little bit of a shame to say this, but you know, I grew up in Kansas surrounded by Republicans. I'm sure in my early stages of life, I've said or thought things that I'm not particularly proud of now. I thankfully was willing and a lot of coincidences put me in a place where I was willing to listen and learn. And so I don't believe as a white man, I can under, a white man from Kansas that have li has lived in Columbia considerably that I can ever fully understand the issues you're speaking to Tracy but I thank you for inviting us here to listen. Well, I appreciate your, your willingness to be um, honest and vulnerable. I think those are really important traits that we pull into our politics. Um, as a matter of fact, black feminism is based on a love of politic that you look out for everyone. Um, so if you look at the history of black women, you'll know that that's been the cornerstone of their politics is we need to take care of our community. Justin um, Aldred posted some good questions here and I wanna go through them and then kind of work our way up to um, the questions that are the, at the top of the list that are related to um, gender and religious uh, issues because those are hot button issues in Missouri. But Justin asked, how can you make effective changes that support your district while acting as a member of a minority party within the Missouri legislature? I think that we've covered that already. Um, campaigns are long, costly, and overall fatiguing for candidates. Will you be prepared to run a campaign if a special election is called in 2021 and then immediately run a subsequent campaign during the regular election in uh, 2022? 
And then there's one other question and we'll come back to number three is, do you believe the upcoming redistricting changes will affect your election or campaign? If so, how? So um, I'm, I'm gonna post that last question um, down here so everyone can see it. But I read them out, I read them out about loud. Um, I think the last question probably encompasses um, kind of all of that in, in terms of your commitment to 21 and 22 and redistricting. You wanna go, David? Sure, so um, yeah, and I agree a lot of that was covered as far as, you know, being in, in the super minority, you know, about relationships and such. I think we all touched on that. Um, yeah, and I think I, I think you have to be committed to the process as far as running. So um, I don't. I made the decision. You know, I thought about it. Uh, I had actually planned on doing it uh, when Kip uh, seat turned out, um, and then you know Martha Stevens called and said you know she was behind me on that. So I kind of helped the decision process. But you have to be in it. Uh, it's difficult. But here's the deal. I mean, life is difficult. Change is difficult, um, and it's not always easy. Um, you know, I, I run a law firm and, you know, it, you know, that's going on, but it's hard and, and you're not going to accomplish anything, um, without struggle. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, and all I've known in life is struggle. You just have to keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely I'm in this and I'm in this for the long haul. Um, it, it's not a, just not a, something, it's not a hobby, um, Redistricting, that's a big question mark. I, I would think that in my, where I live, I would think that I would not get redistricted out. I mean, I, I, it's kind of up in the air. Um, so I, I would, hopefully that, that wouldn't affect me, but it could. Um, I, I don't know, there's a, there's a definite way to know that yet. I would hope that it would make it more fair okay. around the rest of the state. Right. Um, what do you think about that, Scott? I, in terms of the only part I disagree with what David said was in terms of them making it more fair throughout the state. <laughs> Frankly, there is just no reason for them to do that. Yep. In a worst case scenario, uh, basically with the gerrymandering, they've got Columbia basically into Martha's district and Kip's district. I wouldn't be surprised to see if they find some way to try and combine that into one district. But I don't know if that's really possible, but I'm sure there's going to be an attempt to do that. The idea is to ensure for the next 10 years, Republican control. One of the things that Kip has mentioned in public. Okay, thank you. Uh, is publicly is that uh, for the Democratic Party, we haven't really reached the lowest level yet. So it's going to take a lot of work to turn us around and build. And we're going to have lots of the obstacles in addition to what David had mentioned in terms of just trying to win seats just in general. In terms of being in this for the long haul, I don't think any of us would be volunteering because we know what's involved with this going forward. And it's going to be interesting. COVID is still going to be a factor coming up for the next several months to a year. So that's going to affect campaigning. But I think all three of us will be able to persevere and get through this. And I'm sure all of us who don't get chosen are going to be helping to make sure that one of the, us is going to be going to Jeff City to ensure that we go forward. I don't think on any of the issues, any of us are that different. We may come from them from different perspectives. We definitely have different backgrounds and different skills that we bring to this. But I think overall, I'm optimistic. I think whoever gets down to Jeff City to represent the 45th is going to be basically hitting the ground running as much as they can. Sadly, we are going to probably miss every representation in 2021 because of the way this is going to work. But that doesn't mean that things can't be prepared for going forward. And also it means of assuming that the uh, governor even calls for a special election. Sadly, there's a chance that he may just decide it's not that important to bother with mm. and figure that's tough and that could be a strike against Kip for vacating that seat. That possibility really has to be looked at, but we really won't have a good idea of that until January. Okay. So, Tracy, I'll 
noticing the uh, time as a presence resource, I'll hit these two questions really quick that you relayed from Justin. The first question was, am I prepared to run a subsequent campaign a year after 2021? Absolutely. I feel like Scott Crystal took my joke already about the long haul, but in all, in all honesty, the 46th and the 45th are key resources for the Democrat Party and Columbia and our Columbia community. These are safe blue districts that should be constantly fundraising to build the war chest. I am not seeking to be empowered. I am seeking to empower. So that way then we have a bench to challenge, to challenge Rowden in two to four years, or even again, challenge the, uh, try to seek the 19th Senate district once it's an open seat. You, the second question you relayed was, do I believe redistricting will change our elections or campaigns? Honestly, no. The irony is if clean Missouri had maintained its status in the Missouri constitution, then the 45th and the 46th would have been more competitive and there would have been a real risk of us being uh, drawn out of our districts. Now that the status quo was maintained with the last referendum issue, I don't see our lines changing that much. If the majority party were to change the lines, they would make the 50th and 47th more competitive. And I don't think they want to risk that. Got it. Um, I had one question I'd like to interject. Um, I know this is not scripted. You guys didn't get this on the uh, question sheet, but that's what it is. <laughs> but assuming that each of you um, independently might be elected to this, this position, what would be the top two priorities that you might pre-file uh, legislation on? I mean, if we're just going to like go off real quick, I mean, the 45th represents Mizzou. Education, both K through 12, through the foundation formula and higher education has to be first and foremost representing that district. Second issue, of course, I believe has to be Medicaid and health issues. The 45th houses some of the largest hospitals in the state. Those hospitals represent a large portion of the uh, service industry in our community and the service industry represents a disproportionate part of the 45th. Mm -hmm. Uh, did, just to elaborate a little bit, um, did you have any specific uh, legislation that you would consider? Like, is there a particular policy or program that's in place that we need to re revoke or improve upon? Or is it, I mean, like the topic is fine, but is there anything specific to the environment that you might actually target? So the facilitation of the statutory facilitation of Medicaid expansion involves language that I am not necessarily, that I, I don't know what language is needed at this point on that. For those key issues, I mean, spoiler alert, the attorney who's into tax policy is also a big nerd. I am very interested in an earned income tax credit. We are one of we are one of the, if not the only state in the in the US that doesn't have an earned income tax credit. I believe it's a key, if you are it's a method of getting money directly into the working poor. Republicans like it because it's a tax credit, it reduces tax burdens, and it's not, and it's not a quote unquote entitlement. You have to be working and have taxable income to get it. However, it's one of the, I believe it's one of the key ways to immediately address poverty because you're getting money directly into working poor as opposed to putting them through another bureaucracy uh, mess of vouchers, food stamps or something like that. Okay. Um, an easy change that I see for helping all Missourians, because right now we have a budget problem due to dereliction of leadership for years. If you're a business owner, if you're a business owner and you remit your, if you pay your sales and use tax to the state on time, you get two percent of that back. You know, if we as individuals pay our taxes on time, we might get an audit. You know, good job. Why does why should Walmart and CVS get a discount for doing the same things expected of all of us? That's one of the, that's, that is a statutory change that just requires removing two lines of text that have been there since the thirties. They're an anachronism. There is no reason why these corporations should be getting that discount now. Is a value business more than they value people. Um, I want you to- Do you want to let the others weigh in? Uh-huh. Scott? I'll weigh in real quick. Uh, in terms of what Caleb said about the tax for small businesses, or a 2% on time tax. He's absolutely right. That is an anachronism. I would modify it to the sense that businesses at a certain level would be entitled to get that. But companies like a Walmart or the larger ones 
no, that would no longer be appropriate for them to get that. It comes in handy for the small businesses, even though it may not amount to a whole lot of money for them. It is something that's appreciative and it does make something that does give the incentive to help them pay their taxes on time. Where most of the money is lost on that is for the larger corporations. In terms of other legislation that for pre-filing, I think realistically we need to have to be looking at 2022 and what the situations are at that point is harder to say. In terms of talking, in terms of general types of things that I would like to see. I'm not going to take the time right now to do that since time is going to be getting scarce. But there are issues I'd like to address. And if there are bills that I can prepare to do that for helping business or doing things with entrepreneurship, I do have some ideas on that. But right now, they're not specific. They're more of a general type thing. So I don't think that's going to do more Answering in a specific, I don't think is really going to be helpful at this point or answer your question really very well, Chad. David. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we are, it's kind of a time crunch, but um, you know, I like what Caleb said about uh, you know, Medicaid issues. I mean, healthcare is always important for all aspects of the community. Education is always important. I'm a small business owner, so I'm always in favor of, of of uh, tax breaks, but, and I agree with Scott in that, you know, maybe nothing till 2022. A lot of that's gonna depend on what Governor Parson does, but I would, here's one thing I would like. And I, I've seen this in my own practice and that because of what happened this last summer with the injustice and we talk about George Floyd, I saw a change in courtrooms about how judges looked at me because they knew this was going on. They knew things like this were happening on TV. So right now I think we have some leverage. I think it's, is things have gotten a little quieter now. So I don't want to necessarily kick the can all the way down the road. I think we need to seize some of the momentum from what's happened this summer because we, and it's like I said, it's been several months and you're not seeing as many things on social media about it. So I think we should seize some of the leverage that we had from this summer and use that legislative. Now what that looks like, I don't know. And it depends what committee you're gonna get. Are you gonna get on the Judiciary Committee? But people are listening right now. I know earlier we talked about well, white people don't understand. Well, if they're listening now, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but they said that 97% of people in America thought the George Floyd killing was wrong. What, whenever has that happened where that many people Agreed. see an event and are on the same page? So let's see some of that momentum and try to get something done for justice. I mean, we're here for that. So those other issues are important, they're paramount, but let's see if we can hold on to some of that and look to see if we can't get something done while people are still in the legislature who remember it, you know, who were who experienced it and were affected by it. Well, I, David, I think that's a good point. I would call it planting seeds. And so my question would have been, how do you plan to plant seeds um, to build on what's happened in this past summer, not just around race, but also around gender equity, around um, immigrants, um, you know, the past four years, everybody that's not white middle class, upper class has been a punching bag. Um, and um, from uh, gender identity to, uh, you know, class, uh, it's, it's been crazy. And it's, it's crazy to me that on the agenda of bills there's stuff on there about guns. Why are we, what is this obsession of, of, of making sure that we can kill each other? It makes no sense to me. Um, so I'm going to uh, go up to the top um, here, just because we're talking about the, the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act, which would add sexual orientation and gender identity to Missouri's Human Rights Act, um, which currently prohibits discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations for other protected ca categories, including race, sex, and national origin. Do you support this? Um, if there was an opportunity to pass the bill uh, for, for just sexual orientation, but not gender identity, would you support it? So, you know, this is another touchy issue um, uh, like race where people can get really uncomfortable. And I, I, th I think that, um, you know, this is something else where we have to do some growing up. So um, Caleb, I'll let you start first and then we'll work our way back around. To repeat for the audience, the first question is, do uh, we support the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act? Or right, not? right. And if, and if there is an 
pass the bill for just sexual orientation, but not gender identity, would you support it? Okay, so for the first part of your question, do you support Mona? Absolutely. There's a lot of issues where I am willing to work across the aisle and compromise. I am an unapolog, but on this, I'm an unapologetic ally and we can't compromise on this issue. That ties into the answer to the second part of your question, which was, would I support Mona for sexual orientation, but not for gender identity? I would say no. Okay. The reason, the logic for passing Mona in that piecemeal fashion is the logic of the camel getting into the uh, tent. You know, you start with the nose and then you get the head and then, and then we might eventually get the body. Incremental that logic uh, fails. That logic fails in this case though, because if we pass Mona with sexual orientation, but not gender identity, we have carved the transgender community out and they as a group. And I, when I say they, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to indicate is that they will not, I fear that they would not be able to create the political capital later to then have their interests added to Mona. If they're carved out, we've left them in the dark. And that's, I don't support that. Right. And I also want to just add that um, black trans homicides um, have been uh, really um, elevated in the past um, four years um, under, under Trump's. So um, that's a, those, are, those are really difficult uh, numbers to continue seeing. David, your thoughts on Mona? Um, yeah, I definitely support it, obviously. I, and first, I mean, it's, it's, has it been two decades that it was, it was filed 21 years ago? Or, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's unbelievable that it's been that long. So absolutely, I support it. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, Caleb talked about the distinction about, you know, all or nothing. I wrestled with this because at first I thought, I kind of thought, well, maybe, you know, that philosophy was right that, you know, you know, trans people wouldn't have the power later to get it done. Um, it's difficult. I probably would if it was only um, sexual orientation, just because it's incremental progress, um, because it's been 20 years, I probably would. It's, a, it's an awful hypothetical, it's all a situation to be in. I would prefer it not to be that way. But yeah, this is this question, I, like I say, it caused me a lot of turmoil because I went back and forth and back and forth. And do you hold out? And what if you hold out and say no? And then it's another 20 years, right? So then it's 2040 before anything's done. Um, so I, I probably would do it because I think it's in, it's incremental. But, you know, but then again, you don't want to leave out, obviously, the trans community. And one thing I wanted to say too, Tracy, you know, you had asked to touch on part of this when you talked about the violence for Black trans people and how, you know, how everyone can capitalize on this leverage and how, you know, not just black people, but the trans community. A lot of people don't realize, but, you know, black trans women, um, I believe there's a 21% rate of higher incarceration levels. Yes. There are officers that I've read about that will drive around a community and look for, they'll say women with Adam's apples and then arrest them for prostitution. I think there was a case where a, someone maybe in a hotel found a black trans woman's purse and there was a condom in it and then called the police and she was arrested for prostitution. And I don't know, so with George Floyd, a lot of that gets left out. So I think to be able to share those stories that it's not just race, but you have these other issues as well, so. Yes, and I, and I thank you for pointing that out again. You know, uh, again, that goes back to, to police. We talked about training. I would say it's an issue of who you hire. You know, in medicine, you have to, to show that you understand the social determinants of health, that you've put some effort into learning about um, the human beings you will serve. And that's not a requirement to be a police officer. So I, I think we hire the, the, the wrong people for the wrong reasons. And um, they, they have this ideology that's very dangerous. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you for that, putting some more context onto that. David, I, I would say too that, you know, the splitting the baby, I would look at it kind of like splitting the baby and how long it took for the LBGT community to come together um, through the AIDS crisis because um, people weren't willing to take that risk. Um, and it took, it took much longer because people were not willing to take that risk. And I think um, that sort of incrementalism um, did hurt uh, the gay community uh, for a long time. So just something to think about. Uh, you're, under, you're right that this is a kind of a horrible scenario, but I think it does go back to planting seeds so that we don't, um, we're, we don't come up with, oh, it's okay if we split the baby in half um, because it's, it's 
too difficult to think about, you know, doing the political work of, of recognizing everyone's humanity. Um, Scott, do you want to go ahead and respond to that as well? Sure. And like David, I wrestled with this too. Gayla brought up an excellent point about, as did David, that it could take for years for the other part of this to get passed. I think the, the approach, since we're talking hypothetically, is to fight for the whole thing for as long as possible. Yes. Then if it gets down to the point that it's, you either do it this way and leave that out, or you get nothing, as a last resort, I would go for it, splitting the baby. But it'd be something that I would fight to the very end, because I think at that particular point, at least we've got the foot in the door. And even though that takes time or may take time, the seeds are being planted, as you had pointed out, Tracy, and it gets set for going in the future. If it doesn't pass this time, you get it taken care of the next go round and time to get other people on board to help pressure those who voted against it. But again, we're talking hypotheticals here. That's okay. I mean, I think, I think talking about the hypotheticals gets us some practice thinking about how we would plant the seeds and strategize for planting the seeds. And I think that's important. Um, and also this round table is not about necessarily having the answers or arguing that this answer is the wrong answer or the right answer that um, there's, you know, we're looking at really difficult um, scenarios because of the political landscape. So um, I wanna read the second question that's on the, um, the document that we put out today. Um, it says legislation introduced in 2020, HB 1926, will prohibit public institutions of higher education from discriminating against a religious student association, any benefit available to any other student association. That means religious organizations would have access to student fees, college classrooms, bulletin boards for religious statements and their activities. What is your position on what is your position on this legislation? B, should religious student associations also have access to public high schools with the same beliefs available as other student associations? So we've gone from race, and we've gone to gender, and now we're doing religion. So I was trying to paste this in here in my uh, in my in the chat box. And so I'm gonna try again. I'm, it's not working too well for me. Maybe Chad it can copy and paste faster than me. I'm trying, Chad. I'm trying, and it says it's there. It is. Wait, wait, wait. Did it work? Uh oh, it worked. There we go. I'm using my phone, and I copy and paste. I copy here, and then I can paste there because I have a Mac. So I'm special, so it's supposed to work. Apple, it's a uh, miracle. <laughs> yeah, be quiet. <laughs> he doesn't like he doesn't like Mac. So we have we have disagreements about my computer, but you know this is how it is. Um, yes, legislate. So this is about religious uh, freedoms. And I think this is just all complicated uh, religion because of the, the political context that's out there uh, with the conservatives. And so um, there's sort of this mixing uh, religion now as um, a rights ploy um, in a way that I think is a little, um, dishonest. That's my opinion. So David, I'll let you go first. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. These are, I love, I, I love these questions because they are, they're complicated, they're difficult. And that, that's really what it's all about. Cause that's what life is about. So. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, the goal is to have a conversation. I don't want to give you just yes or no questions. Like we need yeah, to get yeah, yeah. better at having these difficult conversations. Right. Sure. sure. So, exactly. so you know, my first thought was, well, separation of church and state, but, and so the answer would be no, but the more I thought through that, I thought, you know, generally the separation of church and state is designed to keep church from having authority in the state and the state from having authority uh, with churches. One of the problems with uh, not allowing religious groups to meet is you're in the free speech clause, because if a, within, within a school, so if you have a high school or a college, I think because the current state, I think, is if it's if it's before school or after school, that's appropriate if they are allowing other groups to meet. So it's not a situation where just any anyone can come and they, you know, a religious group can 
they have a special session that no one else has. I think if I think if a school is letting other student groups meet before or after school, I think they would have to allow under the free speech clause a religious group to meet before or after school, as with some caveats though. The school can endorse what's being said. So as long as the school isn't endorsing that speech and it's not, um, they're saying we're behind it and we're promoting it, I think. I think, otherwise, I think they're running afoul of the free speech clause. Okay. Scott, you want to respond to that? Absolutely. Uh, what David pointed out about the free speech is absolutely something that has to be taken into consideration. When I think the issue comes into, and this particular legislation, and please correct me if I'm reading it wrong, is about state funds being provided. And I am totally against that for on so many levels. I don't, if state funds are be, being provided, that takes away from the freedom of speech type issue, I would think. And even though I don't particular religion is not being endorsed, I think it is opening the doors to all kinds of problems, especially because there will be people who are paying taxes who don't support that particular religion or feel very uncomfortable that particular religion is meeting and receiving funds to do so. So I would be opposed to any funding. In terms of them just meeting before or after school, I see nothing absolutely wrong with that, but I do not think that funds should be given because in a way that is sanctioning a religion and saying, yes, you're deserving of funds, so we are, not to be too funny, blessing you and allowing you to be there at the school. So I would be very much against something like this. And just under just to follow under those circumstances. So you're saying you're saying we need. I'm sorry, Tracy. I didn't get you're what you're saying. You we need to dig up those seeds. You, I'm, I, I was just joking and saying you don't want us to plant those seeds. You want to dig those up? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go ahead, David. You I, wanted to respond real quick. You know, yeah, I, I agree with Scott's assessment as well. I don't think state funds should be used. I mean, if they're just, if it's just a meeting, you know, they need to meet in a room, that's one thing, but giving, doling money out, that's another animal altogether. Yeah, it talks about fees and stuff like that. So yeah, once you start making those kinds of transactions, it, it, it elevates it. Uh, Can I interject real quick? This, yeah. this, this is like kind of like my uh, second life uh, working <laughs> uh, secular issues. But I, I, think, I think the thing that we're, we're kind of touching around is that we're talking about religious organizations, not student groups. So, for example, if you had um, organizations out there, and I'll, I'll go ahead and drop like the um, the Missouri Baptist Convention, Don Hinkle, if you're not familiar with him, trust me, you'll get used to him. Um, he's all up in the legislation. But when you have groups like that that sponsor these organizations um, and try to take state funding to finance what they're doing, I mean, they're, they're going in for proselytization. And um, I, I, I think that's something that's uh, not, not to turn on anybody's position, but I think that's the element that we're really focusing on with this bill. I don't know if that changed anybody's position on that, but that's kind of like my understanding of it. Well, again, it goes just back to what we're saying about receiving funding for this. Granted, the proselytization is a side thing, but the key is giving funds to religious organizations. And I think that's where it needs to be addressed in this particular piece of legislation, because that's the purpose is trying to get them to pay for that. Now, Let's say the group that you mentioned goes in and provides the students with money separately to go and pay for pizzas at their meetings and things. That's a harder thing to sit there and say, absolutely not. That money is coming from out, outside, and it's not any different than the students ordering a pizza, assuming the school allows that, to come in during the meeting. But I think the heart of this particular thing, again, is the state funds so that the particular church doesn't have to go into their coffers to pay for things. And I totally agree that the proselytization is a possible result of this, but that I don't think, even though I would be uncomfortable with some group trying to proselytize me at school, that's the main issue here. So if I may answer on this point, I think the many nuances we've addressed actually speak to it, the context of where this bill came from. And I don't support this bill. And let me explain why. 
school administrators have been trying to, they've been struggling with how to balance the establishment and free exercise clause and how they treat student groups. We've had schools that have just said no, no funds or any services full stop to any religious group. David made the distinguishing point that there's a difference between funds in the room. I respectfully disagree. If you're giving, if you're affording those religious groups uh, room access, they're getting utilities, they have the square footage, and they have access to the student population. These, this legislation was not crafted because we have a Muslim student organization or a Jewish student organization that is attempting to provide a safe space for minority populations. This legislation is coming from a mindset of groups that, I mean, full cards on the table, I disagree with them. They are entering into spaces and using the First Amendment as a sword, claiming that they can exclude student, certain students from their group because they don't qualify with their de definition of a religious or pious life because they're gay, because they're transgender. And so they want access to public institutions, but they want to keep members of the public out. And I don't think that's right. And I mean, whether you disagree with it or not, the reason why governments don't tax religious institutions is precisely so that they can readily have the capital to create their own spaces of worship and meeting. I'm not opposed to religious after-school clubs. I was an avid member of one at my Methodist church in middle, in middle school. But that means that I didn't meet on school. After school, I got my butt into church just down the street. That's why we have, you know, Columbia has a great resource. We have many different houses of worship across our city. We don't necessarily need, the best way to avoid discrimination is to be treating all groups equally. And so that's why I don't support this bill. Okay, we have two more giant questions on the board and we have about 30 minutes. So I posted both of them so that you could scan uh, through them. The one is SJR 50 is a statewide constitutional amendment to require students participating in any single gender event or activity organized by a statewide activity association like the Missouri State High School Athletics Association to participate in the event corresponding to the student's biological sex. Should transgender student athletes be required to compete in athletic events according to their biological sex, regardless of how they identify themselves? Men's track, women's track. And then the other one is several bills have been introduced to reset, restrict access to therapy and treatment for gender reassignment. Should medical providers be prohibited from administering any medical or surgical treatment for the purpose of gender reassignment for anyone under the age of 18? reassignment for children under 18 be, of age be prohibited without consent, parental consent. Should Missouri's child abuse or neglect laws be amended to include hormone or surgical treatment for gender reassignment of the individual if the individual under 18? Should it be a crime if a person assists, assists, coerces, or provides for a child to undergo any surgical or hormonal treatment for the purpose of gender assignment? These are weighty questions. I'm going to let you guys um, tackle them whatever, whichever way you want. Um, I want to give a, um, uh, a precursor before you start. Um, there's a great book by Andrew Solomon. It's called Far From the Tree. It's a pretty big book. Um, and if you're interested, I, I, have a, I can send you the chapter on transgender. Um, there's also a documentary, um, I can't remember the name of it, about one of the gentlemen that's in the chapter. And it talks about, the chapter actually talks about the experiences of children who are transgender and what their world is like. And so um, it's very much like the rural uh, urban divide where people don't know, don't know people of color. If you don't know someone who's gay or you don't know someone who's transgender or you don't know what that experience is like to have a transgender child, um, you could be you know, acting and thinking on some instincts that are not very informed. So I like this book. It has narratives about all the different kinds of identities that are marginalized, including children who are dwarfs. It also has a chapter about children who were born of rape um, and things like that. So it's one of those books that you put on your shelf and um, you work through a chapter at a time that's pretty big. 
but I, I'm just saying that as a caveat before we tackle these questions. If you're uncomfortable, um, there's a resource that you can go right to um, to get you thinking about it. All right. I'll try to find my chapter while you guys are talking. Uh, Scott, I'll let you go first on these. All righty, that sounds fair enough. Okay. And I'm not as familiar with the transgender world, so let me start off with that. Okay. So some of the things are going from my opinion now. Maybe some of those things may change later on, and some of what I'm going to say may go against what most of the people in this group does, but... I am always open to listening, being educated, and expressing a change of opinions. Let's start with sports first. Just taking this on the surface, and that's where I have to approach this from, someone who is trans, who believes that they are a man trapped in a woman's body. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. A woman trapped in a man's body and feels that they should go out and run track, I think they would have a decided advantage because even though mentally they are a woman, they still have the physique, the strength of a man. So that may give them an advantage in that particular area. And like I said, I am taking this on the surface of this and I realize and understand the feelings run contrary to this but I'm trying to think of fairness to the other people who would be competing in the race. We don't allow people to take enhancements to improve their athletic performance. And on that level, as I'm thinking about this, that's how I view this. In terms of viewing, and I, should we do both questions? Go for it, yeah. Okay, in terms of uh, viewing about sexual orientation in general, I've talked to people who came out later in life who were gay. I have a good friend of mine I went to school with who, good looking guy, very straight, grew up in northern Louisiana, which with all the connotations, there was no way he could possibly have even considered coming out of the closet if that was, if he had even reached that approach. He got married, had several daughters, and then he realized after after talking therapy and all that, that really he preferred to be with men, which was a big change. The big thing when I, we talked about this that I had asked him is, how long have you known this? And the answer was all his life, which made a big impression on me, meaning that he realized this as a little kid. It's the same, I, I am sure, for people who are transgender, as well as for other gay people, they always know this type of thing. But like I said, it's a learning process and I can still be educated on that, but that's my initial thoughts on regarding sports. In terms of gender reassignment, I wanna make sure I got the term right, uh, for anyone under 18 years of age, I am not comfortable with that because people are still growing and evolving. And there are people who we all know who experiment, test the limits of the boundary, and then decide, no, this is the way I want to go. I think under 18, in most circumstances, is they just don't have the maturity to really know. After they're 18, and they've gone through all the different thought processes on their own or with talking with others, then there is time to go ahead and make that decision. Should it be a crime if a person assists, coerce, or whatever? I don't think so. I do think that the parents should be involved. And yes, I recognize that there will be parents out there who will feel that this is an abomination and not their kid. But unfortunately, 18 is a cutoff for becoming an adult. There's a lot of things you can't do until you're 18 or older. And at this particular point, that's how I feel that this is an area that should be waited until they get that one, until they get absolutely sure. I think there was one celebrity who had changed his identity or his gender. And then all of a sudden he decided that after years of being changed, maybe he made a mistake and he should change back. Um, 
it's a tough decision really for anyone. And for someone who is 18 or I'm sorry, younger than 18, why put them through a situation like that until they are absolutely sure? And I think most parents, and I recognize not all, would be supportive of their children. Okay. And do send me that chapter on that, Tracy, please. I just posted it in our chat. It's a, a chapter called Transgender uh, via Andrew Solomon's book, Far From the Tree. I also posted a link to the documentary and I'm trying to find one other item. David, you wanna respond? Sure, th thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, these are very difficult issues um, and very relevant issues. Uh, thank you for posing them. Um, and I agree with Scott in the sense of, you know, not being an expert in the field. And I, I too want more information and I wanna learn and thank you for the, the text you mentioned. Um, you know, as far as, you know, the first issue regarding uh, athletes and, you know, whether it should be a bill prohibiting athletes from competing. And I think as Scott uh, um, mentioned, I think one of the controversies is, you know, athletes who go from male to female competing with other females and whether it's fair um, to the other female athletes because of testosterone levels. I'm not an expert in the field. I, I've done a little bit of, I, I mean, I've done some rating in it, but I'm, I'm sure not the expert at all. Um, I've, I've, one of the things I heard was that, or read was that men overall generally tend to be 10% stronger, have 10% more muscle mass than females. And that 10% advantage could result in, in um, inequity or unfairness to some of the uh, biological female athletes. Um, I've also read that people can uh, lower testosterone levels down potentially when people are transitioning and, and or something along those lines, but it only gets down about 7%. And so you're in a situation where um, there's still a 3% advantage, uh, which could be unfair. I don't know the answers to this. I, I, I'd like to see more research on it. I think it's premature to start passing legislation prohibiting you know, people from doing this at this point until um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't support legislation for prohibiting this yet until we have more information um, to just go out and kind of a knee jerk, we're prohibiting it. And as Scott said, you know, a lot of our information is surface level. And I don't want to, and I think a lot of people are very reactionary and they hear a story on the radio, and they're like, let's pass legislation. Let's get more information. Let's educate ourselves and make the right call. So it's fair for everybody um, on that point. The other, the other question is obviously a very, very difficult one about the um, you know, gender reassignment, um, surgery, surgical gender reassignment. Um, again, I'm not an expert in this. I, I've looked at various articles and, and tried to find some type of orb of consensus or, or something along these lines to help decision-making along that. These are tough, tough issues. Um, and I've seen a lot of different viewpoints. I, one viewpoint suggested that um, if, if a minor wants to get the surgery, uh, you have to look at the emotional maturity of that particular person, whether they're 17 or what, or say, you know, it's on, on a case by case basis. I, I've heard, I've read that uh, sometime it could be to an advantage of someone's uh, a, a minor, maybe not 18, because they can recuperate with their family as opposed to being 19 or 20 and recuperating around a loving family environment uh, as opposed to being re recuperating in a dorm room or an apartment when they're 20. Although I wonder why they couldn't still recuperate at home, but there's that. I've also read something that said, uh, minors are never in a position to be completely emotionally and mentally mature enough to make those decisions. So I've seen it for kind of from both sides. So my position would be more information. I'd like to know more about it before legislation is passed uh, to see if this is something that is, you know, something that it's appropriate for minors to do, or they haven't reached the, the age where they're, they're, they're completely mature enough to make these calls. Caleb. Hi, can you guys hear me? I keep getting notifications that my connection's unstable. So do I, it sucks. Oh, okay. <laughs> it wasn't happening before, so you, You've posited, I don't know if the members of the audience have the full document we have, but there's five separate questions. I'll try to go through over broadly instead of point by point. The first one is the proposed constitutional amendment to 
requires uh, single gender events to uh, exclude mem exclude transgender youth from sporting events and only have people be able to participate based on their quote unquote biological sex. My approach to this is we need to remember the question is, should we enshrine this in our state constitution? I have a very low tolerance for bullying. As a youth, my name lent itself to being called Galeb for about two years. This proposal is just bullying. I mean, it is, it is grown political leaders targeting transgender kids in our state, and I, I don't support it. When, when, whenever this issue comes up, I think we can, it can be addressed at the student level, at the student and school level. Putting this in the state constitution was just inappropriate. Um, the next uh, question was about whether medical providers should be prohibited from administering medical or surgical treatment for gender reassignment surgery for anyone under the age of 18, and should those treatments require a parental consent? I don't think this is the type of thing legislation should be addressing right now. Look, we, this is very similar to just passing more laws to create more barriers for women to have access to abortion. This is putting the government in between the, the decision-making of a healthcare provider and their patient. This is also hitting at the, the reason the why the second proposal is proposed that surgical or hormonal treatments needs to be restricted unless you have parental consent is because of the idea that someone who's under 18 and may not be sure of themselves may seek the treatment and receive it without, without knowing the full consequences and without parental consent. We need to remind ourselves that this treatment is not cheap. It's not like being 16 and sneaking out, going to living campus and getting a $50 tattoo and then hiding it. It is a major commitment of not just your resources and yourself that I don't believe we should be just passing a law that interferes in that process. The last main areas of Tracy's questions were uh, whether gender reassignment surgery should be treated as like child abuse if the person who receives the treatment's under eight or uh, should it be a crime for a person to coerce someone into undergoing hormonal treatments for the purposes of gender reassignment? Again, I disagree. I don't support these measures and I disagree with them. These, in my mind, these proposals come from what we saw 10, 20 years ago uh, with the gay movement where there was this idea of the gay boogeyman that gay parents would wanna raise their kids to be gay and they would force it. This is just a rehash of that argument, but for the transgender community. Assuming we have this individual, because I, to be fair to these proposals, I could see the real concern that a parents, regardless of their gender affiliation, may be abusing their child and forcing a child to undergo these surgeries. I can understand where that fear comes from. However, if that person exists, their abuse is not going to be limited to the single instance of forcing their child to undergo surgery. There's going to be other signs and the law already has adequate measures to catch and punish parents that are abusive to their children. We shouldn't be drafting new legislation to target the gender community. Um, thank you for that, Caleb. That was excellent. I want to throw something really crazy out there. Hey, before you do that, I, I just want to weigh in on, on the transgender bills. Um, Cool, and I, and I put some resources here and we can download this chat thing and I'll email it to you when we're done so that you have these. Um, so don't feel overwhelmed that I put those links. I, I'll download it and I'll email them to you so that you have them. But um, like last year, I believe there were almost like 20 anti-trans bills that were introduced into uh, MOLEG. And every single one of them is pretty much a straw man argument. Um, a lot of the questions that were discussed here, um, number one, the medical community does not condone or even authorize any kind of surgical transfer, um, um, transformation or reassignment until they reach the age of 18. The same thing with hormonal treatment. Uh, children, in one of the age of 18 does not get hormonal treatment. What they get put on are puberty blockers that keep the body from going through uh, the radical changes induced by puberty so that if they choose to carry through once they reach the age of adulthood, that they can determine, okay, I want to transition and now you know, the, the body has like a much easier way of actually presenting as intended. Um, so like the, the legislation in question um, across the board 
um, was, was really just creating some very strong in arguments. And frankly, by even discussing this type of legislation, um, you're, you're kind of trumping medical practices in general. I mean, that profession is highly regulated and they have their own um, information. This is, this is out there. But I wonder, I want to make sure that was kind of apparent that what we're talking about here, because <laughs> we're, we're, we're legislating to something that doesn't exist. And yes, it sounds like a horrific thing, but it doesn't bear out in reality. So, um, you know, me, I tend to get very, very upset with the um, individuals who introduce this legislation because, frankly, I think they are educated on it. They know these things and they substantially misrepresent uh, the positions because of their own personal interests. And um, so going forward, as you look at these resources, I just want you to keep that kind of thought in mind. And if you ever do engage with other candidates or politicians, and you hear these arguments, uh, they're completely bogus. Um, and it's just, it's just creating this, this, uh, this boogeyman approach to, to draw up support. So I would just challenge you with that at least. Um, um, before we let everybody have their sort of their, uh, closing remarks, I want to throw something really crazy out there. And that, that is, is that, um, gender like race is a social construction. We are taught to perform being male. We are taught to perform female. Those are considered normative categories. Um, it's just like people think that you can act black or you can talk white, right? Or you can, you know what I'm saying? These are all social constructions of a way of categorizing and sorting people out. And depending on your worldview, when someone doesn't act you know, it's like people tell me, well, you don't talk black. Well, then how do black people talk? You know what I'm saying? It's stupid. But, you know, so this idea that people might exist in a world that's non-normative um, is very uncomfortable for a lot of people. So, yeah, these strong man ar arguments are aimed at um, channeling your discomfort for non-normative. So I just want to, to put it out there that the way that we um, embody um, gender and all that is deeply social constructed. We've been surveilled our whole life about how men should do this and how women should do this and women should speak like this and dress like this and stand like this. Um, you know, I get this about being bald headed. Well, uh, what does your husband think about you being bald? You know, because women are not supposed to be bald. Well, my husband's bald too, right? So what are you gonna do about that? Uh, you know, there's a medical reason why I don't have hair, but I'm just saying there's this way of looking at gender um, that we are putting some constraints and fears there um, that are our social constructions. So I'm just putting that out there to um, for you to think about. Um, we need to uh, wrap up. We have about 10 minutes. So um, I'll let you both, all, all three of you have about um, three minutes to um, um, close up and, and give your thoughts. And uh, we'll start with David. Uh, th thank you for uh, having this forum. It's excellent. Uh, and I've learned a lot uh, through this. And thank you to, the, uh, to Caleb and Scott. I appreciate your input. And it's been, uh, and I appreciate your participation in the process. And I think we need good candidates involved in this because uh, democracy is important and there's a lot at stake. Um, I think I'm the best uh, candidate uh, in this race, uh, primarily, I think, for several reasons. I mean, one, my background in, in regards to criminal justice, um, the work I've been involved in, I still, my firm is still operating. We still do criminal defense work. Uh, we have litigated against uh, entities, you know, uh, for example, uh, you know, you may, we may have a guard that beats somebody and that we've gone after them in court. Um, we've my work with the review board, um, a very difficult time getting that passed. It still has work to do, and it's it's not perfect by any means, and it needs to pivot from, you know, this original creation to um, dealing with like racial profiling issues, and it's equipped to do that. I think the the people on the board just need to understand their purpose and what they can do. So it needs some tweaking, obviously, um, but because of my work in that, I've been involved in the community regarding that as well. Um, and also, um, thirdly, uh, if I was nominated, if I'm nominated and elected, uh, I, I believe I've been told I would be the first African-American from Boone County to serve in Jeff City. 
Um, and that's not important for me as much as it is for the youth of our community to have role models um, that they can succeed. I grew up in Columbia. I'm not a transplant per se. I mean, I've been here, I went to elementary school here. Uh, uh, I've lived in other states when I was you know, uh, a lot younger, but I went to elementary school here, uh, junior high here. I graduated from Hickman, I graduated from Mizzou. Um, went to Tulane Law School, worked in New Orleans and then came back. And so I think it'd be important for the youth to see that. Uh, I think we need positive role models, but uh, that's nice. But really elections are not about the past, they're about the future. Uh, and we need to fight. Missouri's become redder and redder and redder. I believe in my heart that we're in a state of crisis. Uh, we can no longer go about things as business as usual. It's not working. Whatever's been happening has not been working. I think Nicole Galloway is the only statewide Democrat, elected Democrat in the state. It's awful. And so we're in a state of crisis. I've got a history of fighting. I'm a, I'm a warrior. I fight every day in my practice. I litigate every day. And I'm going to continue fighting for the people and the citizens of this district. Thank you, David. Scott. I want to thank Race Matters friends also. I think this is Form has been very informative. I also want to thank both Caleb and David for running for, for this position. I think it's going to make us all a stronger candidate as we go forward and also work towards the future for accomplishing a lot of things. Like David, we are in a situation that is a crisis. I also think in any crisis, there's a great opportunity for change. With all the things that are going on, people overall, regardless of their persuasions in terms of their political beliefs or their general beliefs, realize things are not right. We have a great opportunity for creating change, shifting the directions, building on the foundations of what we believe in, the, the ones that have held and where they haven't held or where they need tweaking, this is going to be the time to do it now and the next few years. In terms of my background, a lot of it is in business. I've worked for myself for many years. I've worked for in a family business. I've also worked for another company. So I get the perspective of what it's like to look for someone else, as well as what it's like to meet a payroll. I see a lot of opportunities in terms of entrepreneurial things. I haven't discussed that here because this particular form was looking at so, social issues. So that was not as important. One of the things that I think I'll be very valuable in going to Jeff City for is, I don't think it's important who gets the credit, it's who gets things done. And I think that's gonna be very important when talking with people on the other side and planning ideas, convincing them of a different way to go. And if they receive the credit for it and we get the issues or the legislation accomplished the way we want to, so much the better. I can always come back and tell people in the 45th, I was a part of this. So that I think things can be done that way. In terms of a fighter, I think all of us here are. I don't think that's an issue. We may have different ways we go about doing it, but there's no question all three of us will be able to get things done and make changes. One of the things that I think I can also be good in is because of my involvement in commissions, boards, with the Democrats, with people in general, is to solicit support and get people to, I don't want to say rise up, but to get involved and help make the changes that we think are so important and push us in the direction we're going in the future. And again, I want to thank you all again for this opportunity. Okay, Caleb, you get the last three minutes. We're over, but it's okay. <laughs> I'll be quick. No, no, you're um, fine. Take your time. <laughs> I want to thank everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Tracy, for this opportunity. The This potential special election is interesting because who the next representative for the 45th, it, it may be chosen by an inherently undemocratic process where a committee of 10 or now 11 picks the rep. I'm glad that we had this opportunity to speak to the community and I'm hoping that this is not the end of our conversation. I hope this continues. I am, this conversation gives me hope because I can see a lot of strength from the Democratic Party going forward. If people wanna reach out to me or 
follow me at all, please. Uh, you can find me at a uh, hall from or, uh, to, or, or better Caleb.com. My entire private practice, my entire legal practice, I've been working in public service through the legislature, office of public counsel, and for volunteering with Midmo Legal Services. I'm used to being David versus Goliath. My, our office is 12 people and we have to take on large entrenched monopoly, multi-billion dollar utilities across the state. And we can still, and I've still been, if I may humbly say, still been able to seek multi-million dollar judgments for Missouri citizens. I want to translate those efforts to representing the 45th for mm -hmm. all people, not just the people that like me, but for all people, for all Missourians specifically. Thank you. Um, thank you. For making I just put a note that you can all put your contact information um, in the chat threads. You can type that in there. Um, and then we will also post this to our Facebook page. It's running right now through uh, YouTube, but we'll also make sure it's posted on our page. But if you put your contact information uh, there, um, people will know how to contact you. Um, it'll run when, when we rerun this again. It's running right now live, but um, we'll also put it on our, um, our PWN, our, our YouTube channel uh, via our website, which is racemattersfriends.com. And we have a video library, so you can find it there. Thank you, Caleb, very much. Thank you, David, and thank you, Scott, for joining us today. Um, I do hope that this isn't the end of these conversations, and I hope that it isn't something undemocratic um, that happens. But um, Caleb, you're on point to keep it, all of your keep us on point to reminding us that these are the possibilities that are out there. And we need to be prepared for them. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from uh, the shift that happened in Georgia. So. Um, we should start uh, paying attention to how they built over the last decade, how they made a change in the electorate. It didn't happen overnight, but it was um, was a campaign. All right, Chad, do you have anything closing that we need to take care of? Um, I had something Chad? to add later. Let me just pause yes. real quick. Okay. And I just wanted to point out, this is a change from last year's um, forms and lobbying uh, so as a witness uh, appearance form, this is um, something that anybody who wants to like basically present before any of the committees would need to fill out and um, provide their written testimony. But towards the bottom, um, they added an affirmation statement. Uh, basically, they're saying like, you know, you can be uh, as a witness, as a public member, open to uh, criminal charges for perjury and other offenses um, or contempt of proceedings. Um, so I guess my question is, um, number one, do you have any particular position on this statement or do you have any concerns that the witnesses are signing this but not necessarily the representatives? And I guess the second part of that question is, would you also verbally affirm that your testimony is true and correct in this interview process <laughs> or this round table? Uh, I guess I'll just speak. I think, Scott, I think everyone here was speaking from the hard and true today. So I, um, so I can attest to that. Um, understanding that, um, I think David will agree with me on this, understanding that although we're attorney, what we're saying now should not be considered legal advice. Mm -hmm. I do not know about the enforceability of this provision against particular witnesses before the legislature. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your feedback. Anything else? I will email those items to you. Thank you gentlemen very much for joining us today and uh, enjoy the holidays and be safe. All right. Bye. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you yeah, very again very much for this. No problem, yeah. no problem. See you soon, okay?